Uh, thanks so much, folks. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon to let you know some exciting things on the horizon for the state of Iowa as we will be launching in the not too distant future our pilot program for uh, screening for severe combined immune deficiency syndrome as part of the uh, newborn screening. I serve as one of three medical consultants with this group, um, working along with uh, Dr. Polly Ferguson. And Polly is either already in or on her way to Santa Monica, California. I know she would love to be here, but uh, hopefully she's in a nice sunny spot. So uh, Polly um, has put forth a tremendous effort to this uh, program, as well as our other medical consultant, Dr. Um, Sirbu, who is with the flow cytometry group mm -hmm. as well. So. Um, some quick disclosures, I uh, do do some uh, industry-sponsored clinical trials related to the use of immunoglobulin replacement therapy in patients with primary immune deficiencies. So um, I'm going to start with just a, a little a brief overview of what SCID or Severe Combined Immune Deficiency Syndrome is. And then following that, I have just really three take-home points that I would like to share with you folks um, this afternoon. And the first is, I hope that uh, you'll be able to describe the rationale for SCID newborn screening and really appreciate the reason that why in May of 2010, uh, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius uh, recommended, uh, and she's the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, recommended to the Secretary's Advisory Council on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children that SCID uh, newborn screening be added to the recommended Uniform Screening Program, or RUSP. And this recommendation came after a very extensive critical review, not only of the disease itself as well as its natural history, <laughs> Um, available as well as emerging therapeutic options for babies with SCID. An aggressive look at options for um, the is the technology available and is there a reliable, reproducible, and easy assay that could be used to screen for this disorder. And also, of course, there was a rigorous cost-benefit analysis as well and I'll share some of that information with you as we go throughout uh, today's presentation. I will uh, be able to describe to you the use of TREX, T-cell receptor excision circles, which are being used as the assay for SCID newborn screening. And then finally, I want to give you some updates on Iowa's newborn screening program for SCID, which as Dr. Sheffield mentioned, we hope to be uh, going live with our pilot program uh, this fall, hopefully uh, sometime uh, towards the end of next month. So I'm sure that many of you in the audience are familiar with SCID, or Severe Combined Immune Deficiency Syndrome, but um, it really is a diverse group of inherited disorders that's related to mutations in a variety of genes, all of which are involved in lymphocyte development. There are now over 15 genes identified, and I'll tell you folks, I think that this is really just the tip of the iceberg. I think one of the things that we really will see with national screening uh, for SCID is that there will be many more genes identified that will be responsible for the SCID phenotype. Now, although there are a plethora of different mutations and genes involved, they all result in significant T-cell lymphopenia. And in addition to low T-cell numbers, there is really pretty significant abnormalities in the function of those T-cells and also in aspects of humoral or B-cell immunity. And B-cell deficiency occurs even, or I should say regardless of whether the baby does or does not have B-cells. And then also within the various SCID phenotypes, in some but not all cases, NK or natural killer cells may also be deficient either quantitatively or qualitatively. 
probably the, the hallmark of a severe combined immune deficiency syndrome patient is that of recurrent severe and unusual infections. And the types of pathogens associated with SCID can include a plethora of bacterial organisms, opportunistic organisms, candida, fungi, and a variety of different viruses. In addition, many of these babies will have failure to thrive with chronic diarrhea and rash also common findings. The clinical presentation is variable, and that's um, for probably for several reasons. Um, there can be, depending upon the nature or the size of the specific gene mutation, there may be some residual function of factors allowing for some limited but still impaired um, T cell immunity. Also, these infants um, appear normal at birth and in most cases. And the reason for that is although they have severe T cell lymphopenia, for the first three to four months of life, they are provided with some modicum of immune reconstitution that comes through what would have been the, uh, the uh, transplacental transfer of maternal IgG. But then when mom's IgG starts to drop, reaching its nadir at around that three to four month time point, that's when the clinical presentation of this disorder uh, may present. And it, it really goes without saying that without appropriate immune reconstitution of some form, this is a uniformly fatal disease. And immune reconstitution also can be variable depending upon the nature of the mutation and the extent of the immune deficiency and can range from immunoglobulin replacement therapy, enzyme replacement therapy, um, bone marrow transplant, or emerging gene therapy is on the horizon. But I think really right now, um, a bone marrow transplant represents the, uh, the standard treatment for our SCID babies. And um, it really goes without saying that SCID really is a pediatric emergency, and thus our ability to diagnose these babies very, very early in life before they've had their first infection, life-threatening infection, before they've developed the failure to thrive, can result in significant improvement in mortality as well as overall morbidity related to these SCID syndromes. So um, I just wanted to sort of briefly overview how in the absence of uh, a newborn screening program for SCID, how we might evaluate uh, a possible SCID infant uh, or child in our clinic. And we do have tools that are available. So flow cytometry is an important tool, and I'm going to mention this because flow is also our second tier testing as part of our newborn screening program. It is through flow cytometry that we can actually do a subset analysis of the various lymphocytes. So we can actually determine the absolute number and relative percentages of the CD3 positive, CD4 positive, CD8 positive, and CD45, RA, and RO positive T cells, our CD19 positive B cells, and the CD56 positive natural killer cells. Flow cytometry can actually provide us with a phenotype, if you will, that can give us some clues, even without having done formal genetic studies, as to what type of skid that baby might have. So an example is um, a baby who is, has no T cells, B cells, or NK cells, so they would be phenotyped as a T minus, B minus, NK minus skid. This would be um, a classic example of adenosine deaminase deficiency, or ADA skid, a metabolic defect that results in significant lymphocyte apoptosis and basically kills all of the lymphocyte subsets. Conversely, a baby whose flow cytometry demonstrates T minus, B minus, NK plus would potentially likely have mutations in one of the recombinase activating genes or in the Artemis gene. Um, a um, mutation uh, frequently seen in the Navajo Indian population secondary to a founder mutation. 
And then finally, probably a classic skid, which is X-linked severe combined immune deficiency syndrome, demonstrates a T minus B plus and K cell minus phenotype. And that is what we see with mutations in the interleukin-2 receptor comma gamma chain, as well as in JAK3, which is a signaling uh, tyrosine kinase that actually links to uh, the IL-2 receptor. We can also assess lymphocyte function, so quality is just as important as assessing quantity with respect to the evaluation in the clinic or in the inpatient setting of a possible skid baby. And we can assess proliferative responses to T and B cell mitogens as well as to recall antigens and anti-CD3. We have the ability to assess uh, natural killer cell function or killing using a chromium release assay. And it is also important to assess quantitative as well as qualitative aspects of uh, immunoglobulin. And then finally, in order to really know what type of skid a baby has, um, specific uh, mutational testing or genetic testing would be necessary. So guys, once upon a time, once upon a time there was a boy named David. And I'm sure many of you and perhaps know the story of David Philip Vitter, the bubble boy. And as, as I was preparing for today's presentation, I noticed that David was born on this date back in 1971. And so today is his birthday, and if he were still with us, he would be 41 years old. David is famous in many ways. Not only famous as being the bubble boy, and there was a movie, named after that, but also perhaps famous for the NASA-created spacesuit and his NASA-created playroom. David is perhaps also famous for some questionable ethics related to the research at Texas Children's Hospital where this young man lived almost his entire 12 years in their NIH-funded clinical research unit. And finally, David is famous for, and perhaps maybe this was David's most finest hour, which occurred approximately 10 years after he passed away, following the development of EBV-induced lymphoproliferative disorder after receiving an unmatched uh, transplant from his older sister, um, Catherine. But again, it was about 10 years later that uh, Naguchi and colleagues at the National Institutes of Health, as well as Jennifer Puck and others, independently identified the mutation causing X-linked SCID, and that being mutations in the IL-2 receptor comma gamma chain. And it was amongst the uh, samples used to identify that gene included uh, uh, autologous B cell line that had been developed from David's bone marrow on post-mortem analysis. So David had X-linked skid, but there are a variety, I, I alluded to earlier, of a variety of different mutations all involved in various aspects of T cell development that can result in a skid phenotype. So components that impact on cytokine receptor signaling not only included X-linked but autosomal recessive forms of SCID related to mutations in JAK3 or the IL-7 receptor alpha chain. Abnormalities in a phosphatase, which is important in regulating uh, signaling and also T-cell activation can cause SCID. And there are a variety of different gene products that are important in um, uh, the generation of both T cell as well as B cell receptor expression. And then and aberrations here can result in profound T cell lymphopenia and a skid phenotype. And finally, there are the metabolic abnormalities that result in the uh, production of um, um, various mediators that are quite toxic to the cells. And so patients that lack adenosine deaminase or purification purine nucleoside phosphorylase will undergo pretty extensive lymphocyte apoptosis. I took this particular graphic from an article by uh, Lisa Kalman to just sort of um, visually illustrate how different mutations uh, can cause a skid phenotype. 
And as you may remember, although um, the um, B cells and the NK cells uh, develop and differentiate in the bone marrow, the thymus plays an absolutely critical role in the development of, of T cells. And it is through this process of extensive signaling that there is proliferation and differentiation of, um, of T cells. And mutations, again here, and I reviewed with you on the previous slide related to interleukin-2 receptor comma gamma chain, JAK3, or ADA deficiency, are going to result in a block in T cell development very, very early on, and also a block in NK cell development. And thus, you'll get that T minus, it could be B plus or B minus, and NK minus type phenotype. And then as you can see, where some of these other mutations then impact on other aspects of T cell development in the thymus. This um, graphic actually, I want to try to give you what we thought were the relative frequencies for the different SCID variants. And this comes from Rebecca Buckley's work at Duke University Medical Center and represents uh, about 30 years of experience at Duke involving over 100, uh, 174 skids uh, that were seen at that center. And data from Duke found that it was the excellent form of skid, so David's form of skid, that was the most common, at least at their center. 46% of individuals um, had that particular mutation as an explanation for their skid. The second most common form of skid was uh, the autosomal recessive defect, the ADA deficiency. And you can otherwise see the breakdown here on this slide. I think that, and I'll show you some of this a little bit later, as we are getting information from um, seven states that have already launched their pilot programs for SCID newborn screening, the incidence of SCID and the breakdown of the different relative frequencies of the mutations are going to be different from what was found at this one center in uh, the southeastern United States. SCID, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, really uniformly fatal if left untreated. And perhaps this is um, dramatically illustrated in this graphic, also coming from Dr. Buckley's work at Duke, looking at um, uh, 49 infants who were uh, transplanted early in life versus those that were transplanted later in life. And what they found is that the survival, if an infant was transplanted prior to three and a half months of life, was outstanding. And in fact, now almost 30 years out, 94% of those originally transplanted kids are still surviving. Conversely, you get out past that four-month time point, and uh, the outcome or the success rate from transplant dramatically reduces. They also looked at um, cost and the age of transplant. And again, I think what you can see here is that if you can transplant that skid baby early, if you can make that diagnosis early, the cost is dramatically reduced from a baby who was transplanted later in life. A lot of those increased costs came from that by the time they were diagnosed, they'd already had their first severe life-threatening infection. They were in the hospital. They were in our PICU. Um, they were requiring IV antibiotics. They had significant end organ damage, which thus complicated their transplant and prolonged their stay. So survival, as well as cost, is dramatically improved with earlier transplant. So there has to be a way, is how can we pick these kids up earlier? Because almost all of them, they look completely normal at birth. They've got mom's immunoglobulin for the first three to four months of life. They're going to look OK. But we have to be able to diagnose them earlier before they get that first severe infection. Their outcome is significantly, significantly improved. So I think because of just some of those preliminary comments, you can appreciate why even dating back to the late 1970s, 
clinical immunologists really, really were very interested in getting SCID on the newborn screening radar screen. And this initiative um, back in the late 1990s was primarily led by Dr. Rebecca Buckley at Duke and also by Dr. Jennifer Puck, who was at the NIH at that time. And so one of the initial tests that the two of them proposed for newborn screening for SCID was, you know, just get a CBC with a differential. Just look at the absolute lymphocyte count. And there's data that actually clearly shows this also comes from, from Duke, where they looked at skid versus control infants. And what you can see is that the absolute lymphocyte count in the skid was almost uniformly below 2,000 at birth. Conversely, the control group here um, the absolute lymphocyte count was, in most cases, greater than 2,000 and on up into the 8,000 range. In addition to a um, marked decrease in the absolute lymphocyte count, their data also showed that if you actually just looked at the absolute T-cell count, those skid babies basically had almost zero CD3-positive T-cells in contrast to a much higher number, nine to almost close again to 7,000, 8,000 in the control group. So it was this kind of information that led them to think, how about could we just use a CBC and a differential as a newborn screen for SCID? Now there, over the years, there were some other <coughs> tests that were proposed for newborn screening for SCID. And that included, um, and this was based on an observation that skid babies have elevated IL-7 levels in the serum. So Sean McGee out in California uh, actually looked at um, a measuring IL-7 levels on a dry blood spot as a possible skid screening tool. Um, there was another group, Janik et al., who looked as is, is actually could you detect the um, several important proteins involved in the T cell receptor CD3, CD4, 45 complex, might that serve as an appropriate screening test for SCID? And then also there was some discussion of just doing SCID mutational testing um, as the screen for severe combined immune deficiency syndrome. Well, as we sort of look at all of those possible options, there were downsides to all of them. Uh, a CBC with a differential and platelet count might not always be drawn. It might be a little bit more expensive. You're not going to do that on a dry blood spot. And although in almost all cases, the absolute lymphocyte count is going to be below 2,000, it's not always the case. So you could actually miss a skid baby. The absolute lymphocyte count may be normal or near normal because you're picking up an increase in B cells or there's been some um, maternal engraftment of maternal T cells or there could be some oligoclonal T cells that that baby has. You're not going to get an accurate read. So cost and uh, missing some, some skid babies probably made this particular test not the best for skid. The IL-7 immunoassay was interesting, but um, they were plagued with a lot of false, uh, false positives, and it was not a particularly easy technical test to do and probably not cost-effective. So that's gone by the wayside. Uh, looking for particular uh, proteins on the T-cell receptor CD3 complex also fell off the radar screen because this type of testing was difficult to do and false negative results were problematic. And then it was also felt that using mutational testing, perhaps in contrast to cystic fibrosis, we do not know all of the mutations for SCID. And, you know, right now there are 15, but I guarantee you there are going to be a whole lot more. So none of those were really options as a reliable test for newborn screening for SCID. But the test that has come out is the one that is in on everybody's radar screen now, is that of T-cell receptor excision circles that represent circular components of excised DNA that are pulled out as part of T-cell development in the thymus 
and there is a particular uh, signaling joint on that track which is very amenable to a real-time quantitative PCR and you actually detect that signaling joint and that is your readout of TREX and TREX serve as a surrogate marker of thymic output, of thymic function and of T-cells and it's the TREX that's the winner with respect to newborn screening for SCID. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, T cell, actually T cell precursors, cursors come from the fetal liver and the bone marrow. And then T cell development occurs in the thymus and goes through a variety of different steps. And part of those steps involves the formation of the T cell receptor. And it is in the thymus that as part of T cell development, excuse me, or as part of um, the formation of the T cell receptor, that a V variable chain has to join up down here with the J joining segment that also then hooks up to a C segment further on down. And so through some uh, various enzymatic steps, this chunk of the DNA has to be removed to allow those pieces to come together. And it is this excised portion of episomal DNA, which is called the TREC, or the T-cell receptor excision circle, and it is this signaling joint right here that the real-time quantitative PCR detects, and that's our, that's our readout. So that's what TRECs are. Now, TRECs are stable. And because they are episomal, they do not replicate as the cells replicate and go through mitosis. So what that means is that the TREC number stays stable and is going to be highest in the newborn. And as you get older, the TRECs are diluted out and drop dramatically a hundredfold um, as you get closer into adulthood. So TRECs are very, very specific markers of T cells in the newborn and in the immediate newborn period. So TRECs are now being recognized as the surrogate marker for T cells. And you can use dried blood spots, um, blood obtained from dried blood spots on newborn screening cards to actually uh, get the DNA material that you need to do the PCR assay. Although some of the initial studies done looking at TREX as a marker for newborn screening, which were done by uh, Chan and Puck and published back in 2005, the false positive rate that they had at that time was about 1.4%, unacceptable for newborn screening. It was uh, Dr. May Baker and her colleagues in Wisconsin that work rigorously to perfect the TREC assay, and now the false positive rate is less than 0.1%, thus making it an acceptable test for newborn screening. And there is also very little need now for retesting. <coughs> so TREC assay performance. Now, there are now um, seven states one territory and three other now states coming on board that have implemented uh, TREC screening for, um, as part of their newborn screening program. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has worked to provide proficiency and validation panels that participating states can use. There are now 20 states enrolled. You will hear later that Iowa has been down to Atlanta and has been working with the CDC. And all states thus far using this TREC assay have correctly identified specimens as normal, skid, or unsatisfactory. I'll show you a little bit more data, but all skids have been picked up. Of the states now doing screening, they have not missed a skid. And Again, there are lots of different mutations that cause SCID, but what we're finding that with the TREC assay, with absent or very low TRECs, all of the various forms of SCID caused by the variety of different mutations are picked up using this particular assay. 
So the TREC assay is a real-time quantitative PCR. RNAsp or beta-actin are used as control to assure adequate extraction of DNA from the newborn blood spot, and Iowa is using the RNAsp. However, this is probably one of the first, if, if not the first, newborn screen um, program that's come on board without a uniform standardized assay that each state is using. So in fact, all of the current seven states, as well as Iowa and others that are starting pilot programs, have all had, de had to develop their own internal uh, assay uh, for, for TREX and have had to work using advice from other states and using the help from the, from the CDC to develop um, an appropriate high throughput, accurate, and valuable, uh, valid, excuse me, valid track assay. Now, um, Stan Burbrick and uh, Lucy uh, Desjardins, um, both with the State Hygienic Lab here in Iowa, have put hours and hours worth of work into developing the TREC assay here at Iowa. And um, I can't tell you um, how hard they have worked to do this. They have visited with the folks in Massachusetts and the folks in Wisconsin, which were the first two states to bring on a skid as part of their newborn screening program. They've also been down to the CDC to work with respect to some of the uh, proficiency, proficiency testing. It has some very unique features that the other states have not incorporated. And one of, I think one of the most important things is it is 100% automated. And Iowa is the only state right now who is uh, using 100% automation. It can really decrease human error and cost savings can, can be huge. So uh, Lucy and Stan have really worked to develop a very, very robust TREC assay uh, here. Lucy has worked to assure that we have purchased the best, as well as the least expensive, but still the best reagents to be used for this assay. They are using the RNASP as their control for DNA extraction, and that has worked extremely well in their hands. Lucy has supplied me with some slides, and I hope I can do, do justice, but she and Stan will certainly be available to ask for you if you have any specific questions you would like to ask about this assay. But you start off with those uh, dried blood spot on the Guthrie card, and you take a 3.2 millimeter punch, which gives you about three microliters of blood. The punches are then plated onto the bottom, put onto the bottom of a uh, 96 well micro titer plate and then actually sort of put into uh, the, the little sort of, I guess, PCR plate device. Um, again, through a series of uh, uses of buffers and extractions, the DNA um, is extracted. It is 100% automated. And then uh, it is actually placed on the applied, I think it's the applied biosystems via seven instrument where the uh, quantitative uh, PCR is, is performed. And when uh, the PCR is done, uh, what uh, Lucy and Stan are able to do is develop a uh, calibration curve using TREC plasmids at different, uh, at different dilutions to generate their standard curve. And it's really, really look clean. They're also then able to generate an amplification plot, which then um, graphs, depending upon how many cycles the PCR is taking with the different uh, calibrations, different collab, yeah, am I saying that correctly? The different calibrations. And then what I'm showing you here is this is live data. Lucy has run uh, 48. I think about 48 uh, dry blood spot samples and put them through the TREC assay. This is the amplification plot that was generated that really shows very nice tight um, uh, banding of the, of the TRECs that are enumerated. And then over here also very tight close banding of the RNASP or the RNP DNA control. Um, and if any of you folks do have questions about this specific assay, 
I have my wonderful colleagues, Stan and Lucy, uh, right here, and they can really provide you with a lot more of the specifics and the intricacies related to this particular assay. So I wanted to now just take a little bit of time and think about the concept of newborn screening and if SCID meets those criteria. So some of the criteria for newborn screening is that um, the prevalence of the disease uh, has to be um, greater than one to 100,000. And that is absolutely the case for SCID. And in fact, this number here may be, um, may be dropping. SCID is probably more common than we ever thought it was amenable to newborn screening. Can this disorder be detected by routine physical exam? No, I already told you, these babies look completely normal at birth and can stay healthy for the first few months of life. Does the disease cause serious medical complications? Well, I think I already showed, you already know and I showed you some data that this really is uh, uniformly fatal if not treated within the first several years of life. Is there a cheap, sensitive, and specific screening, screening test? Yep. That TREK assay is the winner. Is there a confirmatory test? Yes, there is. And what we will be doing here at Iowa as our second tier test is a lymphocyte subset analysis via flow cytometry. And does early detection improve outcomes? Absolutely. And again, I showed that earlier, um, both with respect to um, survival as well as uh, cost. You can really decrease overall mortality and morbidity from skid with early recognition and early treatment for that. So um, again, a little bit of history. So given all that information, um, SCID was actually um, nominated to the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children back in 2007. So it was nominated, but it did not get a go-ahead vote. So. And the reason for that is that they wanted additional studies done before they were going to approve it. And those studies have now been done. They wanted to be sure that at least there was at least one prospectively identified case of SCID using this technology. And yes, there has been. And not only one, I'll show you data on how many have been picked up, not only in Wisconsin and Massachusetts, but our other states. In addition, they wanted to make sure that other states were going to be uh, willing to come on board. And yes, that absolutely is the case. The initial false positive rate for the TREK assay, um, Chan and Puck's data, 1.4% unacceptable. Again, May Baker and her colleagues at Wisconsin have now been able to refine the assay, so the false positive rate is less than 0.1%. And finally, the CDC has created the Laboratory Proficiency Testing Program. So having met all of those additional requirements, um, it was in May of 2010 when uh, we got the endorsement for SCID to be added to the recommended uniform screening panel. Wisconsin was the first state to start their pilot program for newborn screening SCID. That was in 2008, and I'll show you some data on three years of experience on SCID screening from that state. I'll also show you some data that is now about nine months old, uh, kind of looking at uh, the results of the TREK assays from the states who have already brought this on board. And then um, just earlier this week, uh, the Iowa Department of Public Health finally approved the proposal that uh, here in the state of Iowa we can add uh, SCID to our newborn screening panel. And uh, Kim Piper, who's the um, executive director of, this, of the Iowa Department of Public Health State's genetics coordinator, probably not giving her title correctly, actually facilitated this effort uh, for us. So thanks, Kim, for that. So here is some of the data from the um, initial uh, uh, seven states that started uh, doing newborn screening for, for SCID. Again, Wisconsin was the first in 2008, followed by Massachusetts. Selected screening for uh, the Artemis gene mutation amongst the Navajo Nation, then New York, California, Louisiana, and then Puerto Rico now have their programs up and going. As of April 2011, Almost uh, a million had been screened, and I, this is probably low, and those of you who are behind the podium probably can't see this, 
but 14 skids have been picked up. That's 14 classic skids. Six um, leaky or variant skids have been picked up. And 40 cases of significant T-cell lymphopenia related to other conditions have been picked up. And this is absolutely fascinating. And so although this is newborn screening for SCID, we're going to end up picking up a lot of other genetic disorders and other medical conditions early on because there are some other things that also have low tracks. With respect to some data, um, and this comes from uh, New York and California pilot data, they're finding that, and this is also true, this is similar to the Duke data that uh, Rebecca Buckley published. There is still um, a male predominance for SCID, but as opposed to Buckley's data that showed that X-linked SCID was the most common form, the pilot programs for newborn screening SCID are actually showing, no, that X-linked SCID is only 11%. It's the autosomal recessive SCIDs that may actually be more common. In addition, we are seeing differences in the, um, the um, ethnic distribution of this disease. And again, you know, Duke University, maybe it's just their unique population, but their data show that 81% of SCIDs were Caucasian. Now, I know that these are small numbers, but there are no Caucasians yet have been, that have been picked up. 67% were Hispanic, 22% African American, and 11% Asians. So we are learning a lot about SCID just from several years of experience from those states who have already piloted it. Now, Wisconsin, again, started in 2008. So this, is, this comes from a publication of three years of experience of newborn screening within that state. And 53% um, uh, were for normal. And here you go. Let's see. Here we go. They picked up five skids. But they also picked up four 22 Qs, four DeGeorge. And they picked up 14 who had other metabolic, chromosomal, or congenital anomalies. I think I see a future for a whole lot more work that our genetic stocks here at Iowa are going to be doing. And in addition, there were some other conditions, gastroschisis, uh, lymphatic malformations, um, that resulted in profound lymphopenia and markedly diminished tracts. Now this is three years of experience from Wisconsin. This next slide takes Wisconsin data and also more information we've gotten from California, New York, um, et cetera. And so these are some of the other medical conditions that we're picking up with low uh, TREKs on the TREK assay. So we've got our 22 Qs or our DeGeorge, Charge, Jacobson, Trisomy 21. Wisconsin picked up a very new mutation in a RAC2 uh, gene causing T cell lymphopenia. And then most interesting, a recent publication of a form of autosomal recessive hyper IgE syndrome secondary to a DOC8 mutation was picked up with low TREX on that baby. Secondary causes of T cell uh, lymphopenia um, have been found to have low TREX, thymectomy in neonatal cardiac surgery, neonatal leukemia, gastroschisis, these um, lymphatic malformations resulting in third spacing and extreme prematurity. So again, we are going to learn an awful lot about the immune system and genetic disorders from newborn screening for, for tracks. So if you get a zero track, almost all, st if you have a zero track, you've got SCID or significant T cell lymphopenia based on pilot data we have from um, from the other states that have done this, and all the classic skids have had zero treks, not just low treks, but zero treks. We're learning that uh, uh, skid is probably much more common that, than that initial one to 100,000, or even maybe one to 50,000, and at least in the state of New York, one in 34,000 is what they're picking up. I also showed you earlier some data suggesting that autosomal skid, autosomal recessive skid is going to be more common than X-linked, and that uh, Caucasians may actually not be the population most likely affected, affected by skid. So where are we here within the state of Iowa? Ooh. Well, as Carol has told me, 
The train has left the station, but it's really just the, the tip of the iceberg. And um, we are uh, really, really have a lot of work ahead of us. Actually, I'm going to go back to this slide here real quick. Uh, with respect to getting this up and going. It was this past spring when Carol got the working group together for our first conference call. Throughout the spring and the summer, we worked on getting the group together to put together educational materials that will go out to primary care providers related to uh, newborn screening uh, for, for SCID. Lucy and Stan and their group at uh, both at Oakdale and out in Ankeny have been all over the country uh, working to develop the, um, the Trek assay here at Iowa. Uh, thanks to the help of uh, Emily Phillips, we were able to get uh, IRB approval to have uh, pooled uh, Guthrie cards on now three of our skids here at Iowa and four of our 22 Qs born here in Iowa pooled and de-identified and then we will use those known Iowa skids and 22 Qs for Stan and Lucy to use uh, to actually um, practice or further refine uh, our current, uh, current Trek assay. Uh, Sergey Serbu in the Flow Lab is really working with us to get a very specific skid flow cytometry panel up and going. And then we're also working on um, our uh, short-term uh, follow-up program. And this is really, this is truly a work in progress that we'll be able to um, uh, do the TREC uh, screening after that uh, dry blood spot has been collected um, shortly after the baby is born. Uh, a flow or an algorithm in place that if um, zero or low treks are detected on our trek assay that we have a means to notify the primary care physician and also contact the parents. We have second tier testing in place which again will be flow cytometry with the CBC and uh, differential and arrangements are underway to make sure we get that sample for second tier testing delivered here to the flow lab at the University of Iowa uh, within, within 24 hours. And then if um, our second tier testing is abnormal, we will be working to get these babies here for further uh, evaluation and more uh, definitive diagnoses. It, um, this effort uh, has been and will continue to be dependent upon the aggressive dedication and work and passion of, um, of the folks listed here on this, this slide. And again, thanks to Polly and to Sergey as the other medical consultants uh, for getting, um, uh, helping us to develop the program here. I think many of you know uh, Carol Johnson, who has uh, been tireless in her efforts to get the group together. If you have not met uh, Emily Phillips, she has to be one of the most dynamic, organized, talented, passionate young women I have ever met. And I tell you, um, she's just really helped me so much in, in getting this up, this up and going. Uh, Courtney Kremer, who's in uh, pediatric rheumatology, and then Steve Rummelhart in pediatric hematology, oncology, are really going to help um, us work to put together the, the long-term follow-up plan for this program. The State Hygienic Lab, again, there's a whole group of people, but Stan and Lucy, I, I really can't thank them enough. And um, I also have to tell you that they have really, I think they are put in Iowa on the radar screen in newborn skid screening with respect to the um, trek assay that they have that they have developed here so i really really have to to thank them but you know um in in addition to like all of us that that work here is that perhaps it's also very important that we thank the patients and the families who are affected by skid and so although some of you may have seen this video, I just wanted to take a few minutes to um, say happy birthday to David here on his 41st birthday and share with you this uh, YouTube video. And although once upon a time there was a boy named David, the future looks bright. And I think that uh, with newborn screening for SCID, Iowa as well as the other states, 
can make a huge difference in children's lives and in families' lives. So I thank you all for your attention. And um, I, I think we do have just a little bit of time for, uh, for questions. And uh, as this is being recorded, Emily has the microphone and she can pass it around. And I also think that myself, as well as Stan and Lucy, will be able to stay after Grand Rounds if any of you folks have additional questions or if you really want to know all those wonderful details about the great Trek assay they've developed. Great, thank you. So it looks like if the trek isn't zero, but it's abnormal, you can uh, say that over 50% of those children, once you do the follow-up assay, will be normal, and then you can stop worrying about it. But in the meantime, do we have resources that we've developed to give to the primary care providers and the families, maybe web resources in, in lieu of Google, uh, for parents to look at while they're worrying about the results and the turnaround time? So actually, um, part of the working group uh, has been to develop reading materials and literature that will go to uh, parents um, as you know, with um, when they're doing the newborn screening, and also to primary care providers. And some of that stuff is over on the table, which includes um, uh, we're going to have an, a new insert into the um, Iowa Department of Public Health brochure that already exists for newborn screening. So there'll be a separate insert describing the SCID program. The um, Immune Deficiency Foundation has also um, done a lot um, and developed brochures and other educational materials and so we have those as well that we can provide. We're going to send to primary care docs and parents as well so that they can go on on Google but they can also have some hands-on materials. The one thing actually just um, your question uh, makes me think about um, because there is no standard TREK assay that is being used by all the states each state develops their own assay, and each state develops their own TREC cutoff point. And in order to develop our TREC cutoff point, uh, Lucy and Stan um, are feeling that they need to do 3,000 uh, newborn blood spots. I understand that there are about 3,000 babies born each month in Iowa. So if we start our pilot program, say by the end of October, within about a month, we'll have our 3,000. And then Lucy, Stan, myself, the other medical consultants, and Sergey in the Flow Lab will help us to determine what the cutoff point is going to be. What we've learned from other states, if the, your trek is zero, you've got skid. So we move down one way on, on, on our algorithm. You know, we, we, do, we get them here, we do our confirmatory testing here and go from there. If the TREC is, is low, we arrange for our confirmatory testing. And this is going to be the, the blood for the uh, flow cytometry and the CBC with diff. And the courier will bring it here uh, pretty quickly. And once we get those results back, then based on, on the flow, we'll know if um, this is likely a skid or something with significant T cell lymphopenia, which still warrants uh, further evaluation either in the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting. Yes? Do you want to just repeat my question? We have Emily running over with the microphone. <laughs> Why is there no standardized assay between the states? You know, I think I might turn that over to either Stan or Lucy to address. We're going to argue with each other. And you know what? I think I'm going to do, Lucy, just a second here because we've got one microphone for the crowd and the other for the taping. I'm going to pass that to you. I think that this is not going to be good because I might not be able to get it back. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, so it's a really good question. Why, why is there no standardized assay and why would you say that you need to implement a newborn screening test when there isn't a standardized assay? And it has caused uh, a lot of 
confusion would be, I guess, a, a good thing to say. Um, I think that, well, one of the reasons are states are all pretty independent and um, they all have different levels of expertise. So when we did our, our site visits to Wisconsin and to Massachusetts, there were as elements of their testing that we knew would not work in our situation. It worked very well for them, but it really wouldn't translate here. And um, I think every state has sort of discovered that. And the screening was put in, the, the time frame um, that this came about is pretty short. I think you saw that from the times where we first recognized that this would become screening and, and, uh, and when it was to be implemented. And the technology in molecular diagnostics is incredible, as you're all aware. It, it's just going forward leaps and bounds. So we really felt, and I think other states do as well, that you want to take advantage of the latest and greatest and the expertise of your laboratorians. And I got to say right now, um, I do appreciate the credit, but it wasn't me. It was a big group of people in our laboratory that worked real hard on this. And we have a great team uh, um, that are, have been working very hard to develop this. And we just thought that there were things that we could do to make this test a bit more robust and to work here. And with, with the absence of any standardized material, there isn't any. Every state does have to still develop their own cutoff points. They, have, they, they just have to. So um, I guess that's some of the things I thought of. Stan, do you? There's the, the. Thanks so much, folks. And, um, we look forward to uh, launching the newborn screening program for SCID here in Iowa. And I tell you, I think we all get by with a lot of help from our friends. And I have to say that the working group here, this is probably the funnest, best hard job I've had in uh, a long time. And um, thanks to everybody.